The text that is set before us here today has been termed as the theme of Paul to the Roman church. It's his central and focal point, that which he's trying to emphasize. Contained within this jewel of the New Testament is the dynamic for life and for living. Since the fall of man, man has placed quite an emphasis upon trying to find meaning in life and trying to find real joy in living. And uh, in that effort, he's usually ended up in great frustration because in all of his efforts, in all of his trying, in all of his desire to fulfill that which he lost in the Garden of Eden, he ends up being a very frustrated person. And, and, and very often, and in fact more often than not, we find this same spirit carried over into the Christian life, into the church. Uh, which should not be, but it's very prevalent in the church, and it's something that you and I have to uh, deal with when it comes to victorious living, which is what Christianity is, is all about. Up until the time of Christ, man found his life very frustrating as he would try to please and he would try to achieve and he would set goals for himself and always, even as Paul said in Romans 3, always coming short of the glory of God, always coming short of what was expected, never quite measuring up, never quite achieving what he wanted for himself or what others expected of him and certainly short of the expectations of the Lord. But one day, God sent His only Son into the world. And when Jesus came, He shared with us a new dynamic for living. He shared with us something that had never been shared with the world before. He shared with us the availability. He shared with us the opportunity of victorious living. He shared with us the idea and the thought that you and I can face living and come out on top. We can be victorious. He showed us how to be saved and then to conquer this life. Paul begins this letter much like an 18th to 19th century classical pianist. He begins it as they often did as maybe the pianist would be at a party and uh, it would be time for him to play his piece. He would go to the piano. Everyone would be talking and milling around, as would be natural at a party. He would play a few chords and get things started. Everyone would start to get quiet and to be seated. And then he would start his theme. And such is the case with the writing of Romans. Paul starts out by telling us of his apostleship. He tells about the calling of the church. He tells about his longing to see her. And then, without any hesitation... He gets in to what is the purpose for his writing, the theme of his writing, the power of the gospel in the life of man, the power in the Christian's life of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Although Paul did not set out to write a, a theological treatise uh, on how to live victoriously, in a sinful world, as he, as he shares with the Roman church his experiences of living, of, of 30 some odd years of walking with the Lord after, he, after his experience on the road to Damascus, it becomes, this writing of Romans, one of the greatest masterpieces of all time in the teaching of how to live victoriously. In fact, it, is, it reaches its pinnacle, of course, in Romans chapter 8, where he uh, so proudly announces that there is now therefore no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. And he announces that those that will walk in the Spirit will be free from sin and death. And then after that, he begins uh, to share with us some practical guidelines for living. But I want you to follow with me this morning. I'm just going to take two verses here today and share with you the dynamic of living from Romans 1. If you would take your Bibles, please, and turn. Romans 1, 16 and 17. A very familiar passage. He says... I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first 
to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith or faithfulness. The great apostle wastes no time in sharing with us and declaring his obligation and his eagerness in declaring to the universal church, the Greek and the Jew, the gospel which had the power to deliver man from bondage to sin and that which was to enable him to live right. Now these words that I'm sharing with you this morning um, are my words by God's grace. Uh, I've not copied these out of a book. Uh, I've sought to wait and to pray and to study and to read. And what I have here is what God has shared with me this morning as I have attempted to put them down on paper. And uh, so you, you please uh, bear with me. Anytime any man ever says you shouldn't preach on Romans till you're 40, I'm only almost 37. <laughs> and so I'm trusting Jesus this morning to help me. So you hang in there with me and, uh, and you pray and ask God to help me up here. The great apostle wastes no time in sharing his obligation and his eagerness to share with the universal church uh, about the gospel that is able to deliver us from bondage to sin and to help you and I to live a victorious life. You and I live in a world which is 20 centuries older than when Paul wrote this. 20 centuries older. We're 20 centuries deeper in sin, 20 centuries further away from the gospel and the power of the gospel. But yet, I submit to you this morning that that gospel has not lost one speck of power. That gospel is more of a reality 20 centuries after these words were penned on parchment than, to, than, it, than it was then, it's greater now Amen. by God's grace. Amen. It can break the power of canceled sin and set the prisoner free yes. by God's grace. And I tell you, this morning, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is bound up with her sin. She is not free. She is not able to praise. She is not able to worship and oh, God wants us to be free. God wants this power of the gospel of Jesus Christ not to be preached so much to the lost, but to be preached to the church. This passage has been so misused and, and, and preached in a wrong way for so many years. It's not an evangelistic passage so much. I suppose it could be used that way. But folks, it's for the church. Paul wasn't writing to the lost at this point. He was writing to the church. He was writing to you and me. He was writing to Christians who were, who were trying to live victoriously in the face of awful trials and awful temptation. Listen, their Christianity wasn't a spectator sport. Their Christianity wasn't that which they paid a ticket for and went and sat down in the stands and listened to some great evangelist preach the word. That wasn't their Christianity. Their Christianity forced them to hide in the catacombs to worship. Their Christianity meant that if they were to come out public and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, it meant death for them. It meant to be drawn and quartered, burned at the stake. And yet Paul says, I am eager to preach the gospel. I can't wait to get started in Rome. You remember at the waiting on God, Brother Him said, Now when somebody's up here singing, preaching, testifying or whatever, he said, There's a thousand people here nearly. He said, You want to pray because they tremble. Pray that the Lord will help them. You know, it's one thing when a young minister such as I, when I started out in the ministry, uh, uh, I didn't want a large church in the city. I didn't want that. I wanted a small church in the country. And it's one thing to preach in the country. It's one thing to be out where folks pretty much have all the same attitudes, you know, and all the same ideas, and they all believe the way Grandpa did and Great Grandpa did. In one sense, in one way of thinking, that may be easier. When you go to a city church where uh, this person has this idea, and this one has this one, and this one, I know that's prevalent in the country too, but not so much as in the city. 
And listen, Paul wasn't just going to some country church somewhere to preach. In fact, the historians of the time of the writing of this epistle seem to indicate that the church at Rome was a very large congregation. Very large congregation. Not only was Paul not going to a country church, not only was he going to a city church, he wasn't just going to the county seat, he wasn't just going to the capital, the capital of a state or a nation, Paul was going to the city that was the capital of the entire known world at that time. And he was going and he said, listen, I've, I've taken time now for 30 some odd years. I've waited before God. I spent three years in the desert and God taught me. I've spent 30 years proving the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've seen it change lives. I've seen drunkards change. I've seen thieves change. I've seen killers change. I've seen perverts changed. He said, I am eager now. Let's try her out on Rome. Let's go to the very seat of sin. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to all who will believe. But most Christian lives are lived in utter defeat. Utter defeat. I'm talking to us today. I'm talking to all of us. Utter defeat. How do we know that? Well, because we're, we're not having to pray for grace to be quiet. For one thing, really, most of us. Most of us aren't having to pray for grace to be quiet. So there's not much overflowing joy around, you know. I've noticed through the few years of being in the ministry that just about the time God gets ready to do a work, you'll see a few people start throwing the towel in. Don't throw the towel in. Don't give up. Don't quit. Oh, I've thrown my arms up too, and I've said, I, there's just no way I can't make it. There's no way. I'm too awful. I just can't make it. But then, by God's grace, in a few seconds, I say, Jesus, I'm trusting you to help me. Because when we get our eyes off of Him and onto ourselves, the power of the gospel loses effect in our lives. Now, Paul was going to a city that had conquered the whole world. Great armies, great politicians, great philosophers, great people of education. He was going there. And he was going with a gospel of love. And he says, this gospel will change the world. I'm going to take it to the, to the capital of the world. And it's going to change it. You and I have got to prove our gospel. We must be willing to jump out when we can't see the shore. We've got to be willing uh, to go the other way. A few years ago, I went to a revival meeting at Maranatha. I shared this with my Sunday school class last week. And this is just to illustrate, not specifically about me, but where all of us are to be. I want you to understand that. But I went to Maranatha to a revival meeting, Brother Hem was there, and afterwards I walked out into the hallway, of course it was very crowded. A young lady came up to me whom I, I didn't know, I still don't know her name. She still goes up there, I don't know who she is. And she started sharing with me a story. She had a dream the night before, and she said that she, that she was in a boat crowded with people, and there were all kinds of other boats, and all of them were going down the stream the same way. And she said all at once a young man named David, jumped out of the boat and started swimming the other way. Well, I thought she knew who I was, and she was sharing that because it was, you know, sort of unique. My name was David, and she said, what is your name? I said, well, my name's David. And her eyes got big as saucers. She said, well, I didn't know why I was sharing that with you. See, we've got to be willing to get out of the boat and go the other way. Now, I venture to say that, that almost all of Christianity is in the boat, securely riding down the stream, just like everybody else. But if we're going to have an effect in this world like God wants us to, if, if we're going to, to illustrate the power of the gospel the way God wants us to, we're going to have to get out of the boat. 
And I, I will just about guarantee for every one of us in here, the, the older ones, the younger ones, and those that are in the middle, that the gospel that you've heard preached uh, until the time you got here, most of it wasn't quite right. Amen. Amen. It wasn't quite right. That's not to say we've got a corner on it all. I'm trying to encourage you that the thoughts and the ideas and the attitudes that we have, have gained through our years, most of them are not right because hardly anybody has been following God. Hardly anybody's obeyed God. And, and when somebody walks through like, like Oliver Hogue or Reverend Ham or, or anybody that's doing God's will, we, we think them to be a strange people. When the power of the gospel is active in their lives, we think them to be strange. And we say, no, I'm not going that way. They're different from everybody. That's your first clue. We've got to prove the gospel in this community. God wants us to prove it by holy living. No matter what kind of attitudes are in the community, oh, we, we, can't, we can't piddle any longer. I want us to look at the pride of this beautiful dynamic. You know, we, we, we can hardly make anybody jealous. You know, Paul said that's the reason for the gospel, to make the Jews jealous, unbelievers all jealous. I don't know how many folks we can make jealous by how we live a lot of the time. In fact, our refusal to live the Christian life, to face life's trials, has resulted in a world and a mindset that is rushing towards socialism. I'm going to repeat that. In fact, our refusal to live the Christian life the way God wants us to to face the trials that we have has resulted in a world mindset that is rushing towards socialism. And pride is considered a bad thing oftentimes, but not in this sense that it's used here in the scripture. Paul said, I'm proud. I'm not ashamed. I'm going to a place where I'm going to be ridiculed. And at that time, uh, he had just received the prophecy that he was going to be chained when he went there. He was going to be imprisoned, and so he was. But he went to Rome. He went to the seat of government of the world. And he says, I'm proud of the gospel. Listen, the way God works here, the way God works here, my goodness, we should be sharing with people what, what God's doing here. Lest they think us to be strange. Lest they think us to be hiding something. May God help us. Let's look not only at the pride of the dynamic, but the power of the dynamic. As we said earlier, life for most people is one of frustration, one right after another. And uh, sometimes we go through periods of, of uh, deep frustration when uh, we, we just can't seem to measure up. And Paul is dealing here in Romans with a people that have come out of idol idolatry, immorality, debauchery. The message of the gospel puts a demand on that. When you and I receive Jesus Christ into our heart, it means that we stop some things and we start some things. It means that the gospel is about changing our lives. There's a power in this dynamic. After having heard it and accepting it, you and I have got to live it. We've got to change our lifestyles. Thieves do not steal anymore. Murderers don't kill anymore. Homosexuals become heterosexuals. Moralists become religionists. And they found themselves drifting. And the old life has such a hold. <clears throat> Isn't it something how we start with God and we go full speed ahead and then in a little while we find ourselves discouraged. We find that pull of that temptation drawing us back into the world, drawing us into our old habits. This is where the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes a reality. This congregation has young people in it. 
that are frustrated because they've tried and now they've quit and they've thrown their arms up in the air and said, I just can't make it because for one reason is that uh, they have a feeling mindset uh, just like the rest of us. If it feels good, do it. And uh, we need so much help with that because we're geared to it. We're geared to react to it. And if it doesn't feel good, then we don't do it. We quit it. We stop it. We, we throw it out as no good. Ready to give up. Chuck it all. What's the use? I've tried. I just can't make it. God is looking for some people who are willing to let the power work in their lives. Let God work in there. Paul was coming to Rome with a great message with a message for that church and for that community and for the world that there is an answer to your frustration there is an answer to your problem there is an answer to the sin that so easily besets you it's the fact of the power of the gospel in your life the good news of Jesus death burial and resurrection I think of the Apostle Peter in John 13 when Jesus said, Where I'm going, you cannot. Peter said, Lord, why can't I go? I'll go with you anywhere. Why? I will, I will kill for you. Jesus said, No. Before the cock crows in the morning, you will have denied me three times. Let not your heart be troubled. He goes right into to chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. In other words, Peter, I know you. I know what's in your heart. I know how many times you have failed. I know about your background. I know about your disappointments in life that have made you the way you are. I know about your hot temper. I know about uh, all the times that you have sinned. I know what you're going to do to me. But be encouraged. Be encouraged. God's going to deliver you. God's going to help you. Don't be troubled. I'm going away, but I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. It's going to be all right after a while. And I guess the, the, the greatest news for any church is the old gospel story that if Jesus died and was buried and on the third day rose again, then what can't he conquer in my life? God is about the business in this church of conquering us. May God help us not to throw in the towel about the time he conquers and sets the prisoner free. Oh, there have been so many disappointments, so many frustrations, so many times when we see ourselves failing over and over and over and certainly Satan is ready to to bring all of that up against us in accusation but oh dear ones oh there's a great day coming there's a great day coming by and by I tell you there's a day coming when we're going to be free free at last thank God Almighty we'll be free at last We'll be free from the temptations of this world, free from sin, free from that claim. But I tell you, God wants us to begin now. God wants the power of the gospel to be active in your life today. God wants you to resist Satan. He wants you to resist that power that he has over you. God wants every one of us to be victorious. And it's not as easy as walking around saying, keep the victory, keep the victory, keep the victory. No, it's, it's reality. It's when there's a great attack on your soul and it, it's dark, it's black and you don't see any way through. You say, but God's grace, I'm trusting Jesus. You've got to believe him. He said, it is the power of the gospel to all who will believe. Not to the unbelievers. The only requirement upon the Christian church, upon this church, to get us through and to send revival in this community is that we believe God. We've got to believe Him all the way to hell. If we, if we wake up in hell, we just keep believing Him. I heard my pastor say the other night on his bed after God had helped him in a wonderful way. Before he, he lay down that night, he said, well, Jesus, it just doesn't look like I'm going to make it. But he said, you know, Lord, if I go to hell, I don't know what they're going to do with me down there because I'll just be praising God. I don't know what I'll do. That night, God gave him some help, some encouragement. 
And I want to tell you, folks, God didn't send him here for nothing. God didn't send Oliver Hogue here for nothing. Oh, dear ones. Listen, it's meant a lot of things for us. It's meant a lot of suffering. But, oh, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it by God's grace for anything. See, what I need, what God's doing to me, what I need is to be crushed. The Greek word for power is dunamis. You and I get the word dynamite from that word. The power of the gospel doesn't always come in explosion. No, but it will come with just enough force to break this old granite heart of mine. God is able to break up the fallow ground. And see, God has called us all together. Why, He doesn't want any of us to go by the wayside. Jesus doesn't want any of us to go. And when we go through these deep valleys, see, you, you and I have got to realize that, that areas we go through oftentimes have oftentimes very little to do with us personally and has everything to do with our pastor. Oh, amen. It really does. I know that there are experiences that happen to you. Say, well, it sure seems like it's happening to me. It is. But it's in direct proportion to the calling of this man in this pulpit. And, and don't, give up, don't give up the ship now. Brother Shore's just ahead. It's not far. It's not far. Jesus is coming again. It's not long, folks. At the longest, it's not long. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. We're going to make it. The old ship's sailing on. She's been through many a storm and many a battle, but she's sailing on by God's grace. We must believe, we must believe, we must believe in order to appropriate this power. We must be absolutely sure what Jesus says is true and stake all of time and eternity on it. When God speaks, when He speaks, then folks, you just mark her down and stake everything you've got on it and don't waver from it, not one time. Oh, I hope we can get that. I hope I can get it. See, this passage has been preached as a salvation message, and it is salvation. But see, it's more for the church than it is the lost. Yes. The power of salvation within us. It's not, if, if you preach salvation as only forgiveness of sins, then, then you've only got part of it. If you preach it as deliverance from hell, you've only got part of it. Because folks, <clears throat> the scripture indicates that salvation is, and I'm going to give you a definition. Salvation is the power to do right. God not only brings you out of sin, but He gives you the power to do what's right. That was the great message. That was the secret that Paul got in the desert, at least a part of it, that God will give you the power to do what's right, to obey Him. Well, that's exciting news. Those of you who are frustrated, those of you who've tried and quit, get back in there. You quarreled with your wife on the way to church? Forget it, you're here. Praise Him, plead the blood, ask forgiveness and go on. You got in trouble with your neighbor along the way, a little misunderstanding? Don't worry about that anymore. Put it behind you. The power of the gospel is, is at work in your life. It's the power to help you to do right next time. Oh, if we quit every time we fail, we, we never get anywhere. The challenge that I have for you today is don't give up the ship. Lastly, the prophecy of this dynamic. Verse 17. For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last just as it is written the righteous will live by his faith this righteousness is from God 
a righteousness that is imputed on us or placed upon us and then has its outworking in our lives and everyday living. It's so perfect and it's so powerful that there's no way you and I could have come up with it. No way at all. It had to be revealed from God. Paul says this righteousness is revealed from God. It comes from Him. It's free for the asking to all who believe. He said it is a righteousness which is from faith to faith. Now this is a, a difficult uh, passage to interpret. A lot of different interpretations, but most scholars agree that what it's talking about here is it's a righteousness that starts in faith or faithfulness in trusting Him and it ends that way. But I, I have another, uh, it's a faith that comes from Him, therefore it has to start with Him. God's faith, he, did, did you realize that He has faith? God has faith. He has faith in Himself. He has faith in His Son Jesus and the finished work. He's convinced that there's enough power there to get all the church through if they'll trust. And so God takes His faith in Himself. Now, He's, he's never failed. He never made a mistake. He never lost a battle. So He takes that faith in the evidence of all that we see involved in Him, He takes that and, and He unloads it right down on the believer. He says, I give my faith in me to you. And all you do is exercise God's faith in Himself. Not try to muster up something within you and say, mm, I'm going to have faith in God now. But just take God's confidence in His own ability. Isn't that great? I think it's great. God's confidence in His ability. Why well, I'm a hopeless case up here. I am. I'm more hopeless than any of you. By far. But God has confidence in Himself that He's able to get this old boy to heaven. And I tell you, I am desperate enough to believe Him. Because I know the only way I'm going to make it is with His faith in Himself coming through me. So Jesus, I believe that Your faith is able to get me through. Amen. And Jesus, seeing their faith, healed the man. Hallelujah. And so, as we believe Him and exercise His faith in Himself, I think it's so good. We begin then to do acts of righteousness. We begin to do acts of righteousness, acts of obedience. For he said, the righteous one will live by his faithfulness. So when we don't obey, it's simply because we haven't exercised God's faith in himself to perform that work within us. We've taken him off and we've put ourselves on the throne of our lives and we've tried to handle it and we fail. Listen, the gospel never fails. The good news never failed. Jesus didn't try four or five times, or rather God the Father didn't try four or five times to raise Jesus from the dead. He didn't say, mm, whoops, missed it that time, try again, mm, missed it, oh, whoop. No, he didn't do that. One time. One time. The gospel never fails. Now, as Pastor Hogue shares with us through the rest of Romans, you keep in mind the theme. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation for the saint. To everyone who believes. To the Jew first, then to the Greek. For a righteousness from God has been revealed. From faith to faith. The righteous man shall live by his faithfulness <laughs> praise the Lord may God help us oh may everyone just be encouraged today may you be encouraged 
God is able to get us through. Just don't quit. Get back in there. We're in it together. And by God's grace, we'll stick it out together.